first of all, I really just want to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, because it's a pleasure to be able to talk about some of the great things that I think that the book does. Um, and it does it, by the way, successfully in prose that is eminently, for those of you who haven't read it, it's eminently accessible to the general reader without sacrificing any of the accurate substance, uh, which is really uh, quite an achievement. Uh, as Professor Erpman says, it does uh, illuminate how deals and contracts are part of all families, uh, including the, these families, these non-traditional families she calls Plan B families that are all around us and that deserve uh, support and respect. I'm very glad that she included adoption and post-adoption contract agreements in the book um, because I think that successfully fully open adoptions um, do <coughs> indeed create families. Um, they are non-traditional extended families in which you have the adoptive parents, their adopted child, and then the birth parents, and even the, the extended families of both the birth parents and the adoptive parents. And the kind of contracts that the book talks about, I think, can really be helpful, essential, in uh, making these families, helping these families to be successful. Um, as just mentioned, these PACAs are increasingly enforceable around the country, and um, I think they should be everywhere. Our law in Maryland is pretty typical. The agreement is enforceable for any kind of adoption. It uh, can be modified under exceptional circumstances in the best interests of the child, and the court can order the parties uh, into mediation. Actually, as I thought about this uh, today and I thought back on the, the process that led to that law, uh, I kind of wondered, why do we call it mediation uh, that is appropriate when we're really talking about a family? A family that was created and is continuing to operate as a family. Um, should it really be family counseling as opposed to a family that has dissolved and is engaging in uh, mediation. But it's important to know, of course, as I'm sure probably most of you do, that what are called open adoptions actually cover an extremely wide range of arrangements. So at one extreme, you may have the adoptive parents and the birth parents, they meet, but they just use first names, and then they agree that uh, over the course of the child's childhood, the parents will send photos and letters through an intermediary, so a very limited kind of openness. At the other extreme it is where there's a plan for continuing contact uh, throughout the, the life of the child. And that's what I, I want to focus on fully open adoptions, particularly and especially of newborn babies, because I think those are the ones that, the, uh, that can most benefit from the insights in the book. Um, by narrowing my focus to that group, actually, I'm not suggesting they're all alike. Uh, by no means. Every family, every adoptive family is, is different. But again, I do think that the approach in the book is particularly useful for those families. And I'd like to read a very short passage from the book as well, uh, because it's, it's quite wonderful. It's in the epilogue. And uh, it's about Professor Ertman running into the lawyer who helped draft her original parenting agreement. Uh, between the father of the child and uh, herself. And um, the lawyer, this is a quote, perks up when she hears that the DC lawyer, this is talking about the amended now, the uh, amended agreement, perks up when she hears that the DC lawyer, like her, tried to talk us out of including the mushy emotional terms in the parenting agreement. I'd still give the same advice, she says, clearly unpersuaded by my story of happily ever after. Uh, unlike that lawyer, I am completely persuaded. I think the mushy stuff could not be more important uh, for adoptive and birth parents entering into an open, a fully open adoption. In fact, I think the mushy stuff is more important than any particular details of the agreement because things change and evolve over time in any family and perhaps particularly in these families. Um, adoptive and uh, birth family members, they, they not only need to understand and accept one another's expectations, they need to have real mutuality. 
they need to have a kind of a shared commitment to a philosophy or, or a vision of what this fully adopt, open adoption should look like, what this new family should look like, in order for them really to, to survive and to flourish as things change. Uh, one of the most eminent researchers and clinicians in adoption, a, a psychiatrist named David Brzezinski, I think he explained it when he said, um, we have been particularly impressed by the mutable nature of adoption triad family relationships. The dynamic and at times unpredictable evolution of intricate connections between biological and adoptive family members. Thus, it must be kept in mind that whatever adoption plan is agreed on at the time of placement, it is likely to be influenced by numerous factors and quite possibly will change in form over time. The process of, of negotiating the kind of pack up with the mushy stuff that the book recommends um, uh, is, can help, I think, in one way, it can help pace the process of setting up the adoption. Uh, there's a lot of pressure in the U.S. for uh, speed in setting up adoptions. Uh, James Gritter, a social worker who is really, in a way, the granddaddy of um, open adoptions in the United States um, at a, uh, it started, uh, this agency started in Traverse City, Michigan, and was really the leader in uh, developing open adoption. And uh, Jim attributes the pressure for speed to a lot of factors, right? People are afraid of uncertainty, uh, the shame of having to place your child for adoption, uh, delays caused by the lengthy infertility treatments that people have suffered through, uh, and unfortunately, the preference that adoption facilitators, that many adoption facilitators have for limiting the time for deliberation uh, in order to avoid the possibility of birth parents changing their minds. Um, if the parties use a kind of standard boilerplate, and you, you can find them all over the internet, uh, agreement uh, that simply mostly just lists the, the frequency uh, and the particulars about phone calls and visits, um, that can facilitate speed, just sign on the dotted line. Uh, but if they have to work through the kind of mushy emotional terms that Professor Irvin illustrates and is talking about, um, I think that can, that can help ensure that the parties are really suited uh, to establish this new kind of family. Um, and of course, it can safeguard against the danger that the parties are entering into it for or the wrong reasons. Um, Ideally, you have skillful counseling and contact with uh, families that are farther along that have successful open adoptions. Um, the, the pressure for open adoptions initially came from, as I think it's discussed some in the book, uh, from birth parents, from birth mothers particularly, who didn't want close adoptions. They didn't want to never know what would become of their child, and they didn't want to never be available uh, to their child. Um, and that fact that they were a, a motivating factor uh, really comports with the history of secrecy and adoption, which I've studied um, to the nth degree. And uh, what I found there was that historically, secrecy and adoption was not established to protect birth mothers. Really, it was protected, it was uh, established to protect adoptive families from interference by birth mothers. Um, so uh, during the last few de decades, then it's made sense that um, mothers from those days, the days in the book uh, that Professor Urban talked about, the, the girls who went away, um, they have been among the most vigorous advocates in many states uh, where I, I have also been involved in advocacy for opening um, birth, original birth certificates to adult adoptees. Um, and uh, those, that access was actually just closed gradually over the course of the last century. And since 1990, it never closed in a couple of states, and since 1990 um, have been reopened in uh, more than a dozen states um, successfully. So I think it's good to have that history and understanding uh, partly you, that you brought uh, to the book. Uh, so nowadays, there is certainly a danger that adoptive parents will agree to an open adoption uh, simply because they won't get the child if they don't. Um, as the book points out, adoptive parents generally do have economic and social resources that the birth parents lack. And I agree that there is that imbalance and that PACAs should be legally enforceable. That mere deals give 
adoptive parents too much power. There, there really, there is a danger of betrayal by adoptive parents, and it does happen. On the other side, actually, there's also a danger that uh, birth parents will disappoint adoptive parents by not providing enough contact as much as the adoptive parents want with their child, and, and that happens too. Uh, sometimes because uh, birth parents retreat in loss and grief, and other times they've gone on to, f to their own lives and founding their own families. Um, but I would, uh, despite the <coughs> celebration, uh, also really add a word of caution about contracts in adoption. And that's because, it, particularly those that are made before the birth of a child, uh, because those contracts are different than the contracts in the other kind of Plan B families that are discussed in the book. In those other families, all we have is the joyful creation of a new family. But in adoption, we have the destruction of a family as well. And uh, I'll quote uh, Jim Gritter again. Uh, he says, uh, the, the extent of the denial of pain associated with adoption is almost conspiratorial. Everyone seems in such a hurry to get to the good news of adoption that the issue of pain is overlooked and short-suited. The joy of adoption is amazingly seductive, and it's rare when a when program really honors the pain that exists at the core of the experience. So again, there is this pressure on birth parents to make a quick decision, painful decision quickly. The, the law has never permitted uh, in this country birth parents to make an irrevocable decision to place a child before the child is born. But in most states in the latter part of the last century, uh, the period of time has been dramatically shortened during which a birth mother may surrender her rights after the birth of the child or during which uh, she could still revoke her decision. In most European countries, the periods are six weeks. Uh, the laws here, even 10 years ago when I surveyed them, uh, provided that in half the states, irrevocable consent could be established within four days of birth. Uh, in nine states, a mother could give irrevocable consent any time after the birth. And in a few, a very small number of states, you could give consent before birth if you ratified it um, after birth. Adoption is a big business. There's a lot of money, a couple billion dollars involved. And adoption providers, many have pushed for these shorter and shorter time periods. The effort has been made uh, repeatedly in Maryland, although it seems to have been abandoned in recent years. We, we still have our 30-day period, which I think has been an incentive to ethical, good adoption practices in Maryland. Um, so what I'm going to be caution suggest caution about is um, the book's criticism that states don't permit prospective adoptive parents to pay for a pregnant woman's living expenses uh, for needed items like maternity clothes. Uh, the book points out that women generally are too, quote, too poor, sick, or young to care for the child, so depriving them of that money is cruel and defeats the ban, quote, on ba baby selling by pushing them into black market adoptions. But if you allow or you enforce agreements about paying these kinds of expenses, it really poses dangers as well. Uh, the deal Im implies that she's not a pregnant woman uh, considering placing her child for adoption. It implies that she's, she's already a birth mother and she's really not unrelated to that child that she's carrying. And whether or not a woman ultimately decides to parent her child, uh, whether or not she's required to pay back the money, um, she certainly feels obligated to place the child, and she very well may not be able to pay the money back. Um, and she understands that changing her mind uh, is going to cause terrible heartbreak for the prospective adoptive parents. So uh, it is, this is pretty, in many countries outside the U.S., this is considered shocking that there could be any agreements uh, before the birth or that the adoptive parents could be present at the birth. So we, we do it differently than many other places. However, for the PACAs, uh, I do think that um, this is a, a wonderfully helpful book and perfectly titled because love is uh, nowhere more important, I think, than in PACAs. Uh, that there be love and respect among the parties, uh, as well as uh, for the child, 
who hasn't had any say in the contract, but who uh, in a successful open adoption is really the greatest beneficiary. Wonderful.